Today, we get to finish the series we've been in, this series called simply Thanks. You know, when we talk about thanks, we've got a lot to be thankful for. If you weren't here last Sunday, we collected over 15,000 pounds of food. And the second service won. First time ever. You know, we were able to feed, to, to prepare and serve almost 5,000 meals for people in need. And that happened because, as Pastor Candace mentioned, because of you. As Pastor, you know, as she said, it happened because of you. So, so I'm thankful just as a representative of, uh, of the staff and being part of this church. I'm so thankful that you guys have caught on and, and, and are running with us with this vision to be a church that doesn't exist just for the walls of our building and just for one another, although that's important. But we exist to bring the love of Jesus out into the community where people are. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful as well that we get to hear God's word this morning from an individual for whom I personally am incredible, incredibly thankful for. I'm thankful for, for Pastor Johnny in the, in the collective sense that all of us get to benefit from his wisdom and his, uh, his compassion and just all the things that make him who he is. But I'm thankful on a personal note as well for him being my friend and brother for the last seven years and just his counsel and encouragement uh, through a variety of situations. Man, I don't know exactly where I would be without him. And today we get to hear God's word through his mouth. So put your hands together for Pastor Johnny Williams. Give me a minute to get myself together. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Hey, I'm Pastor Johnny. I'm the military life pastor here. And, uh, I am thankful for this opportunity to share God's word with you. Um, before I go any further, I want to thank Jesus. I want to thank Jesus for everything. I, I, my wife and my daughter is in the front row. I can't, I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. I want to thank Jesus for this opportunity that he has entrusted me with and the responsibility that he has trusted me with to deliver God's word to you. Lord, you are wonderful and magnificent and I altogether love you. And I praise your holy name right now and I say thank you for this moment. I want to thank Pastor Mark for the opportunity to, to share God's word with you. He's the shepherd of this church and he cares for your soul and he had trusted me with the responsibility, the honor, the privilege to, to share God's word. So I thank you, Pastor Mark, for trusting me. I thank you, thank you for being a big homie for me, taking me under your arm, giving me wisdom and love. And I love you, Pastor Mark. And then... I want to say thank y'all. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. But I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for y'all. I wouldn't want to be a part of another church. No other church in the world. I mean it. People just give of themselves for God's glory here. No, they're not perfect. They're not, they make mistakes. But they love the Lord and they give to God their best. So I want to thank you to be able to serve as a pastor. And I consider it an honor that you would call me brother. I consider it an honor that Ian looks at me and calls me brother. Before we go any further, I just want to share this, 
this, this passage, this text that really touched my heart because we raised 15,000 pounds and all that food is going to go to people who need it. And you're not going to see who you bless, but they going to be blessed. They going to be thankful. You didn't see all the people that, that got the food. You didn't see the woman I talked to who was just going through it. And she said, y'all are a blessing from the Lord. But God did because of you. So let me share this text with you, and then we're going to get into the word. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, and it says, Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge not just a harvest, but the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, on every occasion and through your generosity and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Many were blessed. Many were praising God because of your generosity. It wasn't because of us. It was because of you. And you made an internal investment, an eternal investment. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of your of the service by which you have proved yourselves. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Others going to come to God. Others going to experience thanksgiving. Others going to experience hope because of your generosity. I'm so thankful to be a part of that. I am so thankful to be a part of Epicenter Church. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. That ain't even our passage, but uh, I'm, just, I'm just excited for the Lord. Before we go further, I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for everything. Thank you for all you are. Thank you for your mercy, your everlasting kindness, and your everlasting love. Lord, I pray that I would be empty and your spirit would be full in me and you would speak to your beloved children that your word, the seed, would fall on good ground. Some of 30, 60, or 100 fold and that you would be glorified in our community, our church, and ourselves would be changed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Sam. So I wanted to, uh, last week, Pastor Mark was in Luke 17, and his primary text was from Psalms 100, and I wanted to finish out this series by getting um, a little bit more into Luke and, and really looking at this text. So, if you have your Bibles with me, I want to ask you to turn to Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. Amen? All right, now, let's get excited for God's Word now. So, verse 11 says, Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. And called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. That word, and maybe your translation is compassion or mercy, and they all mean the same thing, or they all have the same word. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And when he said to him, then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Recently, <clears throat> over the law about a decade or so, my mom 
um, she had been dealing with this, uh, this ocular issue, ocular, I guess, disease that really had been um, stealing her vision. And I think a few weeks ago, I, was, I said, man, God did a miracle in my mom's life. And, and this, this, this disease had really hampered her life in the last few years, and she couldn't do the things that she was accustomed to doing. And she had lost all her vision in one of her eyes, and then her other eye was really losing her vision. And so I couldn't even understand the magnitude of what she was going through because she's a strong woman. So on November 1st, my mom went to have a procedure done. And no one knew what would turn out. But God's word is true. And God did exceedingly, abundantly, and above all we could ever ask, think, or imagine. My mom, she ain't wearing glasses, y'all. She ain't like me. She ain't wearing glasses. She said, son, I can see better than you. And she can. <laughs> she can see better than me. God did a miraculous thing. He healed my mom. And she's so thankful. And I remember going to see her just a few days later at her house, and she was telling me all the things and all the gratefulness and gratitude and just giving God thanksgiving. And we cried. My daughter cried because she was thankful that her grandma got to see her the way she is again. My mom got to live the life that God has for her. And in those moments of gratitude, are the blessed moments where God unlocks the unimaginable. So today's sermon is titled, Blessed Moments. Before we get into this, this, this passage and I really go into preaching, I just want to give you a little background because I think it makes it clear and gives us a deeper understanding of what is really going on. And the writer of this text is Luke. He also wrote the, the, the book of Acts. And they are like a combined work. And Luke, um, he wrote this for a man named Theopolis, who was a man of influence and, and, and I guess, power, but he was also a Christian. And Luke, he was a missionary, he was a historian, and he was a physician. And he was a Gentile. That means he was not of the Jewish faith. He was not of the Jewish ethnicity. And that was a big deal because he was called. So this gospel wasn't written by someone who was from the same um, ethnicity of Jesus, but he was a Gentile. And Jesus, and, and, excuse me, and J Luke makes this really clear because he highlights the Gentiles in his writings. And most scholars think he was from, he was from Macedonia which is in Greece, which we would say present-day Greece. And Luke highlights a gospel of salvation for everybody. Salvation is not just for this or this or this, but it's for all people. And he highlights Jesus' ministry directed toward women and women in Jesus' ministry. And he highlights the significance of the Gentiles and Jesus care for the social outcasts. Here in this account, we see the physician Luke intrigued with Jesus' miraculous healing, compassion toward the social outcasts and a particularly positive view toward the ethnicity outside of Judaism. Here, Jesus, at verse 11, we see Jesus and his disciples, they're journeying, they're on their journey toward Jer Jerusalem. Jesus is on his journey toward crucifixion, his glorification for us. And as he prepares to enter this unspecified town, he's encountered by 10 men suffering leprosy. Now, leprosy was a skin disease. It's not like a little, um, you know, a bug bite or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It was a very dramatic skin disease. If you were diagnosed with leprosy by the priest, your life was busting at the seams. It was going to fall apart. And so they was, their life was not only going to fall apart, but now they were going to be outcasts. They're going to be outcasts from their community. 
and it not only made them outcasts, but it was a skin disease that could eat your, like a flesh-eating disease. So their body would be in complete pain. They would be covered in sores, and they could, their body literally could be eaten. Their flesh was being eaten by this disease. And they lived in camps outside because anytime someone with leprosy was around other people, they had to scream, unclean, unclean, unclean. And everybody would stay away from them because if they got too close to them, they would be ostracized and, and put out. But this disease didn't only affect their relationship with one another, with man, but it affected their relationship with God. See, they couldn't go to church no more. They couldn't go to the temple no more. They couldn't hear God's word anymore. They could not offer sacrifices for atonement, for forgiveness, or praise. So their relationship with people was messed up, but it really hindered their relationship with God. So today, we don't got people walking around with leprosy, but sometimes we can feel like outcasts. Maybe our situation makes us feel like that. Maybe our Condition makes us feel like that. But God specially cares for you. Amen? And when you take a critical look at this text, this one point might get overlooked. And I want to highlight it because I call it the universal human condition in the image of God. See, if you look at this, Luke makes sure he highlights or emphasizes that the man was a Samaritan. I can't go in all the, the depth of it, but Jewish people and Samaritans wouldn't hang out. Jewish people thought Samaritans were like dogs. They wouldn't even be around them. But because of their condition, the Samaritans and Jews were living together. Now just think, they couldn't even talk to one another. They couldn't even speak to one another, but because they both were sick, Everything had fell down. And now they were in relationship, not just talking, but living together. What am I trying to tell you? Is that when we start seeing people as people, we start seeing the image of God in everybody, the social constructs that divide us right now will come down. Look to your left and right. People have been divided so long and recognize that the person to your left and right is a reflection of your very savior. So let's not be against them, but let's be for them. Amen. Amen. Here, the text does not tell us in verse 11 and 12, it doesn't tell us that how they knew Jesus, how they knew Jesus was coming. They just knew Jesus was coming. You know what I'm saying? And in, and in Luke chapter 5, they, Jesus healed another leper who was near the same area. So if you read chapter 4, you see Jesus was traveling through Galilee. Now we see him in, on the border between Galilee and Samaria. And this other leper just ran up to Jesus. He broke all the rules. He's like, man, I need Jesus to help me out. So he ran up to Jesus. He got positioned for his miracle. And then he got there and he said, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me whole. He said, if you are willing, you can make me whole. He didn't say healed, but he said whole. And see, these lepers, we don't know how they heard. I'm sure they heard about Jesus doing miracles as well. They heard about his outstanding miracles, his healing, his, his all these things, his, his, uh, he was moving impure spirits. But they was like, hey, maybe the guy from Luke chapter 5 who was a leper was like, hey, man, I seen Jesus. I just ran up to him. I ain't care, man. I just ran up to him and I was like, Jesus, help me, forgive me, make me whole. And he healed me. But he said it from a distance because he didn't want to be, you know what I'm saying? He was like, hey. So they was waiting. He was like, yo, Jesus is coming. Jesus is on the way. What we need to focus on is they was positioned for the miracle. Are we positioned, in the position to receive what God has for us? Johnny, what does that mean? What it means is, if God calls you to come up here and pray, 
and get on your knees and surrender what you're struggling with, get, then get in a position for your miracle. If God tells you to get out of bed in the middle of the night and start praying and ask for forgiveness, then get in a position for your miracle. If God says, man, everything is telling me not to come to church on Sunday, but I believe that you have something for me, then go to church and get in a position for your miracle. And that's what these men did. They got in position for their miracle. And they asked Jesus, they asked him and they cried out to him while he was traveling with his disciples. And I was like, notice what the 10 men said. They didn't ask for healing. As I read this and read this and read this, I was like, why don't they ask for healing? They got leprosy, right? You need to be healed. But they asked for something much deeper than that because their issue was much deeper than leprosy. Our faith got to be, our prayers and our heart got to be deeper than a shallow kiddie pool. And sometimes my prayers can get that like little kiddie pool. You know the one that you can just get your legs in? Just shallow. Lord, let me be deeper when I talk to you. And they asked for mercy. They asked for pity. They asked for compassion. See, they knew that healing would not be enough. They needed to be restored. Because unless the priest said they were restored, unless the priest determined that they had been healed, then they couldn't go back into the community. So they asked Jesus for compassion. They asked Jesus for mercy. And Jesus was aware of their need because Jesus did not declare that they were healed. He didn't say you were healed. He didn't tell them you are healed. But he commanded them to go show themselves to the priests and the priests would declare legally that they were made well and that they were restored. What I'm trying to tell you is Jesus is the restorer. They were restored when they, when, once Jesus sent them off and they moved in faith. They were restored. They were healed. So don't wait for somebody else to tell you what God has already declared over you. Don't wait for someone else to say God has forgiven you when you know God has forgiven you. When God, when, don't, say, don't wait for someone to tell you you are blessed by the Lord. Don't wait for someone to tell you you are an image bearer of God. God has already told you that, and that's more than enough. But they did. The, the, the priest, so Jesus sent them. And what Jesus was trying to tell them or what he was telling them, he was telling them to act as if they were healed. And they were healed. In faith, they started out and they were healed on the way. Recognize that. They weren't healed when Jesus said go. They were healed when they moved in faith. They were healed when they moved in obedience. God is not looking for his commands to make sense to us. He's looking to bless those who have faith and what he calls you to do. His commands don't got to make sense. How many, listen, we, who wants to serve a God that we understand how big his mind is, how big his calling for you is? I, I told the first, I can't even do geometry. How I'm going to understand the mind of God? I'm sure y'all, y'all struggle with algebra. Y'all trying to act like I'm great at math. Y'all be struggling. And if, if, we th if we think that, it doesn't got to make sense. He didn't declare them healed. He said, go show yourself to the priest. That probably didn't make sense. But what they did do was have faith in what Jesus said and obey what Jesus said. Oftentimes, we are crying out in prayer for restoration, healing, forgiveness, or purpose. And Jesus sends us to go somewhere to do something, to move out in faith and be obedient. However, we miss out because we are standing still 
waiting to receive our answered prayer instead of moving out in faith. We standing there like this. Oh, man, my prayer, this, this prayer about to get answered, about to drop. I'm waiting for it to drop. Jesus, it ain't dropped yet. And he said, go. Pray for that sister over there. Help that brother over there. Forgive this person. I'm telling you, start this. Do this. But we still wait. Jesus says, oh, man, I can't go nowhere until I get this. You stuck waiting for this. And Jesus said, your blessing is over there when you move out in faith. Stop waiting for it to drop. Have the faith and obedience to receive God, what God has for you. He's not looking for them to make sense. He's looking to bless those who have faith and obedience in what he calls us to do. Don't miss out on God answering your prayers because you are waiting to receive the answer. Because, see, these, these nine, ten men, they encountered a blessed moment. Everybody say blessed moment. A moment in their life when they received the blessing of God that they could not understand. Have you ever had a blessed moment? Well, it was so good. You were overwhelmed. You were so thankful for God. And they received their blessed moment through what? Through faith and obedience. Don't miss out on your blessed moment because we won't want to obey and have faith in what God has called us to do. In verse 15 and 16, we read, it says, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and, and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Most often when you hear the interpretation of this passage preached, only one of the ten was grateful and thankful for the healing that they received. But I, don't, I believe that's incorrect, and I believe it obscures the point. When we really think about what the leper went through, when we think about what we just talked about of the condition of leprosy, I don't think the worst person could not be thankful for being healed. Right? We all feel thankful when God blesses us, when things go, when we're thankful. Everyone felt thankful. It could be the worst person, even the person who didn't believe in God. If one of those lepers didn't believe in God, I guarantee they were thankful. I guarantee they were shouting for joy. However, nine of the ten went to their homes and families while one returned to glorify God and give thanks to the only one deserving and worthy of thanksgiving. Have you ever been in that spot? Were you the person where God, like you've been praying for something, you need something and God bless you and you receive it and you're like, oh man, I got to go. I'm about to do this, right? And you forget to just stop and be like, not just say thank you, God, because God knows you thank you, but really stop and be intentional about showing God gratitude. Oh, now, y'all good people then. I ain't know y'all was like that. I'm going to tell you about myself, man. Sometimes God will bless me. The other day, we hit a deer. He was just driving, you know, coming back, hit a deer. Boom, man, we could have been, it could have been terrible. It could have been terrible. And I'm in the car, and I say, thank you, God. And we drive home, and I say, thank you, God. But then I look to my left, and I see my daughter and my wife, and I should have been like, thank you, Jesus. Because if I would have lost them, my whole world would have been lost. God deserved more gratitude than that. Maybe you got some crazy kids. You know, I know, I know some of y'all got crazy kids. I've seen kids down there in children's church. Um, you know, sometimes you, you give them something, and it's like they don't even care. They throw it. Maybe you gave somebody a ride somewhere. You've done something really nice for someone. And then once you drop them off or something, they get out the car, and they're like, bye. They don't even say thank you. It's not that they're not thankful. They just forgot to show the gratitude. One of the critical points we must understand and Luke is drawing our attention to is that it's not enough to feel grateful for what God has done, but we must display our gratitude through praise and thanksgiving to God. 
It's okay. We all feel thankful, but that ain't enough. We got to show God we thankful. I believe last Sunday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, that was an act of thankfulness to God for what he has done for you. And I mean that is to say that we wouldn't have been able to do this without y'all. So everybody who came and served and helped, they were almost saying, showing an act of thankfulness to God. And that's how our heart needs to be. That's how our lives need to be. Just an expression of gratitude and thankfulness for God. Pay attention to this, what the Samaritan did. He got on his knees and thanked God. He screamed with a loud voice in front of the disciples and thanked God. He was not concerned with what people might think. He was focused on thanking Jesus. Sometimes we got to, thank you, Jesus! Why? I don't care if I look a fool. I don't. You know why? Because God is pleased that I will humble myself. Sometimes we need to do what he did and get on your knees and fall on your face before the Lord. Look where you at. Look at the gifts that he's given you. Look at the mercy that he's shown you. We too proud to get on our knees and thank the Lord? Yeah. We're going to pray today. We're going to pray today. Sometimes we have to stop being concerned with the other people around you might think and humble yourself and give glory to God because he deserves it. And that might, be, that might mean for you lifting up your hands. That might mean for you coming to the altar and praying. That might mean something different. Some, some of us, it might just mean, it might mean service, not just service. Service is amazing. But we need to worship the Lord. See, our feeling grateful and acting grateful are connected, but they're not the same. You feeling grateful for what God done and you acting in gratitude and thankfulness is way different. You know, my, I say, sweetie, I tell my wife, I'm thankful for you. I love you. Me acting in thankfulness and gratitude and like giving her a back rub and rubbing her feet. Then it's a different story, right? She likes me to tell her, thank you. She likes to display your gratitude. Y'all don't do that? Man, y'all better start doing that. So maybe it's cleaning some, washing some dishes. Maybe it's cutting the grass. Maybe it's, see? Whatever it is, is there's a difference. They're connected, but they ain't the same. And Luke highlights that the one that returned was a Samaritan. And not the Jew, not the Jews, the outsider of outsiders was the one most grateful for what God had done. And I thought about this. I don't know. It says, Jesus says, the one forgiven much loves much. Man, God says from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen. Amen. So the one who was the outsider of the outsider was the one that was most thankful. He was a leper and a Samaritan. As I researched this passage, I come to find out that, that the, the name or the, the, the name, the ethnic name for Jew, what we would say Jew comes from Judah. And what does that mean? To praise. They even knew it was attached to their name to go praise God. But they was too busy trying to get back to their family. Now, everybody wanted to get back to their family. Everybody wanted to be cleansed. But this is an opportunity to give God gracious gratitude and thanksgiving. It's all right to be the nine. Many times we... We are the nine. I am the nine. But God is helping us to see. He just wants to hear you say thank you. Thank you. Amen. While, while those on the outside 
who received a miracle from God were unashamed and stopped to worship God. Just because you're on the outside, if you feel like you're outside of an outsider, God still has love for you. Jesus cares for you. And he has miraculous things that he can do for you. But what was the vehicle to receive their miracle? What did the, Mer the Samaritan get that the others didn't get? We're going to get to it. That Samaritan had thanksgiving. I want to ask you, who does this most reflect? Who in this text do we most reflect? The Samaritan or the Jewish man? See, sometimes we always, we expect God and we forget to praise God. I guess I'll just say it, church people. And sometimes those on the outside are most grateful. I had a man at the Hope Dinner was so grateful for us to say, sing happy birthday. Because he felt he was loved. That is real gratitude. Let's not, let's not leave it because it's a blessed and a blessing locked inside of it. Begin close. In verse 17, Jesus says, We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise, go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus ain't asking a, I guess Jesus is asking a rhetorical question. Didn't I heal everybody? Didn't, hasn't everybody in here been blessed by God? So why is only one thankful? That's what he was saying. Why is there only one at my feet thanking me for what everybody received? It was the one who was the outsider of the outsider. Jesus was disappointed to find that the very nine whose name reminded them to praise him did not do that. But I think he was more disappointed because only one was made well. Only one was made whole. Only one was saved. See, when I looked at this text in the, in, in the original language, the last clause, it says, your faith has, made, has saved you. Most translations say your faith has made you well or your faith has made you whole. But in the original language, it says your faith has saved you. See, being made well, being complete, experience true satisfaction in life, it is only through the salvation of Jesus. It is only by Jesus' salvation. So the other ones were made healthy, but they weren't whole. And God has salvation, wholeness, completeness, satisfaction for everyone in here this morning. Amen. But this Samaritan, he engaged in a blessed moment. He engaged in the blessed moment. And you can too. But what was the difference? Y'all know what it was. He ran back to Jesus. He was unashamed. And he praised him and gave him thanksgiving and glorified God for what he had done. He wasn't looking for another miracle, but he received another one. He, he entered into a blessed moment through prayer, through praise and thanksgiving to God. You can too. Everyone in here today can enter a blessed moment. And God has a blessed moment for you. And you can experience that moment through faith, obedience, 
praise and thanksgiving. Amen. It don't got to make sense to make a miracle. God don't need it to make sense. He was spitting on folk on the dirt and then putting mud on the eyes. He don't got to make sense. It does require faith and it does require obedience. But what God has on the other side of that will make everyone and anyone be grateful. And God uses those means to provide a blessed moment. 